One of the keys to numerical stability when working in higher dimensions is called orthogonality. So let's think back to the simple problem of scalar addition. We found that it had a condition number that could be large when the result is much smaller than the original. Now if we think of the vector version of that problem, and we perturb the input, then we can look at conditioning in the usual way. Changes in value, relatively speaking, over changes in input. Plug in what we know about these things. And a bunch of stuff cancels out. And we end up with what looks like a very simple generalization of the one dimensional result. So that's our condition number for vector addition. And so we want to know when should we be worried? When is this going to be large? When is that denominator much smaller than the numerator? And the answer is very simple graphically. So if this is the vector x and c is nearly the same vector, or negative c, then when you add them together, you get this small vector. So when x and c are nearly parallel, that's when they can cause cancellation error. What's the opposite of that situation? Well, the opposite of parallel, in a sense, is perpendicular. So if the two vectors are perpendicular, then their sum is along the diagonal of a rectangle, and it actually gets larger. It can never get smaller. We can show that algebraically too. So using the inner product form of the two norm, we can distribute the products. And once again, like we saw with least squares, these two terms are actually the same because they're just inner products with the same two vectors. And so we get that term plus two things that are norms. So if we were to make this middle term zero, then we would have the sum of two squared norms. So that means that the norm of x plus c must be at least as large as the norm of x. And that makes cancellation impossible. So by definition, we say two vectors u and v are orthogonal if their inner product is zero. That generalizes the dot product from two and three dimensions. Now suppose we have a list of vectors, q1 through qk. It's natural to put them in as columns of a matrix, capital Q. And then if we look at Q transpose Q, well, by definitions of matrix multiplication, this just gives us all possible pairwise inner products between these vectors. So it's a K by K matrix, which you can see is also symmetric. So now we say that this set of vectors is orthogonal if this matrix Q transpose Q is diagonal. In other words, these inner products are zero when you're off the diagonal. In other words, all these vectors are pairwise orthogonal. We can take this a step further with a special case. If all these vectors have unit magnitude, then 1 is equal to the norm. So that doesn't change if we square it. So that means qi transpose qi is equal to 1 for all i. Then we would call these vectors orthonormal vectors. So what does this say about this q transpose q? Well, those are the things sitting on the diagonal. So they must all equal 1, which means that Q transpose Q is actually an identity matrix. Now we call Q an ONC matrix for orthonormal columns. That's not a standard term, it's just one that we thought was convenient for the book.
ONC matrices have some useful properties. In addition to Q transpose Q equals I, we have that the 2 norm of QX is equal to the 2 norm of X for any vector X. That's a simple calculation using the usual connection to inner products. From that, we can show that the 2 norm of this Q matrix must equal 1. That's just a consequence of the definition of norms. Now we can get even more specialized. That's when Q is actually a square matrix, so K is equal to N. The number of vectors equals the dimension of the space that they're in. So if they're orthonormal and you have N of them, then we call Q an orthogonal matrix, which is confusing. It should be orthonormal matrix, but that's what we say. Orthogonal matrix means orthonormal columns and square. An orthogonal matrix is ONC, but it has some additional properties. First of all, the inverse of Q is the transpose. That's because of the ONC property and because it's square. It's easy to show that Q transpose must also be orthogonal that the condition number of Q is equal to 1 if you're in the 2 norm, and that the norm of any matrix times Q is the same as the norm of that matrix. Finally, if you have another orthogonal matrix U, then the product of the two matrices is orthogonal as well. Now we're ready to talk about a very important fundamental factorization, the QR factorization. Every real matrix, M by N, can be written as the product of Q times R, where Q is an M by M orthogonal matrix, and R is M by N and upper triangular. So using our little matrix pictures, so let's say A is a tall, skinny matrix. Then it's the product of a square orthogonal matrix. That's what the right angle things are for. And an upper triangular matrix, which is the same shape as A. And you notice that if R is upper triangular, all this stuff down here is zero. So you actually have a block, M minus N by N, that's just all zero. So if we write this product out in block form, we can put a zero down there for that second block. So we partition the columns of Q and we partition the rows of R the same way, and you find out that A is just equal to this smaller product, Q1R1. So we call this a thin QR factorization. Q1 is now the same shape as A and has orthonormal columns. R1 is now square and upper triangular. Here I'm going to create a 5 by 4 matrix. Let's see it here. And MATLAB's QR factorization command is QR. If you just call QR on a matrix, you get the full factorization. So the size of Q is 5 by 5, and the size of R is the same as A. Now Q is a square matrix and it has orthonormal columns, so it's an orthogonal matrix. So Q transpose Q certainly looks like the identity. And if we take the difference between that and the identity and then take the norm, we do get something which is comparable to machine precision. So Q, type, so Q transpose Q is the identity. Q Q transpose is also an identity. The other way to call QR is with a second argument, and in that case you get the thin form. They call it economy size. And in this case, Q has the same size as A, and R is N by N, so it's square. And now Q prime times Q is still an identity matrix of size N by N, but Q Q transpose is M by M, but it is not an identity. Now, how is the QR factorization useful in least squares? So suppose we have a thin QR factorization. 
So remember that's orthonormal columns and rectangular times square and upper triangular. So we start with the normal equations which hold for this which hold for the x that we're looking for. And we plug in what we know about a from the factorization. R hat is square and upper triangular. So if all of its diagonal entries are non-zero, it's invertible, and so its transpose is invertible too. So we multiply both sides of that equation by R inverse transpose, and that cancels out the R's, and then the Q's cancel out by the O and C property, and all we're left with is this upper triangular square system for X. So that leads us to an algorithm. First, we find the QR factorization of A, thin QR factorization. Then we compute this vector, Q hat transpose times B, and we solve an upper triangular linear system by back substitution. Now all that does require R hat to be non-singular, which is the same thing as saying that the rank of A is equal to N. I haven't yet mentioned how you actually get this factorization. The classic way that you see in an introductory textbook on linear algebra is to use Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Unfortunately, in finite precision, it's unstable. So a stable way of doing it is to use what are called householder reflections, and that's a subject for the next section of the book.